This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, the subject is universal basic income. I have a philosopher and economist called Weidequist, and this uh, conversation will begin in a moment. Carl Weidequist is my guest. The subject is universal basic income. It is the belief that a certain amount of money should be paid to every citizen of a country uh, to give uh, a better shot at uh, life and also to prepare for the future where uh, hopefully work may be uh, less available. So, uh, Carl, welcome. Before we just get into the meat of the topic, if you could just give a little background about who you are, anything you've written, any books, any uh, proposals, etc., that uh, are germane to the subject. Sure. My name is Carl Weiderquist. I come from Cassopolis, Michigan. Did my undergraduate at the University of Michigan. I have two PhDs, one in economics from the City University of New York and one in political theory from, uh, from Oxford University in the United Kingdom. And I am hired as a philosopher at Georgetown University in Qatar. I've been writing about basic income since the late 1990s. My books include, in, uh, well, let's see, uh, should I go chronologically? Uh, Economics for Social Workers, uh, The Ethics and Economics of Basic Income, an Anthology of Basic Income Research, Freedom is the Power to Say No, two books on the Alaska Dividend, Prehistoric Myths and Modern Political Philosophy, and my latest book is called A Critical Analysis of Universal Basic Income Experiments. And on my forthcoming books are called The Prehistory of Private Property and uh, Justice as the Pursuit of Accord. Well, since you mentioned that you're stationed in Qatar, let me just digress for one moment before we get into the meat of it. Uh, what does uh, a country like Qatar, which is what an Arab uh, emirate, uh, uh, think of uh, this Western notion of UBI? And are they more progressive than we give them credit for here in the West? Uh, yes, uh, Qatar is Qatar is a uh, it's an Arab emirate, but it's not part of the United Arab Emirates. As a matter of fact. The United Arab Emirates, along with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and several other countries, are actually boycotting Qatar right now. It is, uh, so it is an authoritarian regime, but among the authoritarian regimes, as authoritarian regimes go, it is one of the more open and progressive ones. Uh, Al Jazeera, which comes from, which comes from uh, uh, Qatar, is the most, uh, it's the, it's the uh, most neutral of the state-run of the state-run uh, media outlets in the region. Uh, it's closer to something like the BBC than r really anything at all in the region. Uh, so there's a lot of openness here. There's a significant amount of freedom among the citizens and a lot of prosperity among the citizens. As a matter of fact, unlike Saudi Arabia, there are there are no poor countries. Yeah. There's enough wealth from oil and gas exports, especially natural gas, that they're able to assure that Qatari citizens are all out of poverty. Unfortunately, um, they have, they also, they want Qatari citizens not only to be out of poverty, but to be able to afford different service. So they have imported some of the cheapest labor in the world. You have people here for working for uh, as little as $3 a day for, uh, uh, for, uh, Cuttery, so they've imported a lot of poor people. So there is a, a very large amount of poverty here, and there is some controversy about who should be a citizen. There are some people who were in Qatar at the time that it got independence and didn't register as citizens and aren't uh, aren't being deported, but also aren't eligible for all the citizens' benefits, and some of them might be in poverty. Well, let me, let me just talk about sort of what we call the prehistory of universal basic income. A lot of people think that it's a, a socialist idea. A lot of people think it's a communist idea. A lot of people think that it's only uh, come up in the last two or three decades. Does it go back several centuries? You mentioned the Alaska dividend, and that goes back, what, now, 40 years? Yeah, the Alaska dividend was, uh, what, what, the first payment went out in uh 1982, after Governor Jay Hanman had been pushing for it since 1976. Uh, and it was, uh, now, uh, the intellectual history of it goes back much farther. It has nothing whatsoever to do with communism. As a matter of fact, the, the Soviet 
Constitution uh, included a clause saying that those who will not work shall not eat, or you know, some Russian version of that. Um, and that's antithetical to this thing. People um, want to throw this label communist or socialist on anything that is the slightest deviation from what America has today. Uh, you can call it whatever label you want, but all it really is is a way to make any economy, including a market economy, where income doesn't have to start at zero. What we do now is we is we threaten people with destitution, destitution or, or homelessness or eating out of other people's dumps, dumpsters if they won't do what people who control wealth uh, require of them. They've got to go out and get a job, take orders 40 hours a week, and, and uh, as if that has something to do with freedom. There's nothing, there's nothing freeing about being forced to work for someone else. Now, this idea goes back to Thomas Paine. One of the American founders, um, uh, one of the most important American founders, who wrote in Agrarian Justice in the 1790s that that uh, the fact that land is no longer available to individuals, these individuals in the cities back then, and pretty much not to anybody now, means that we're not free to control our lives. We have to go out and get, get a job and take orders. He compared this to say if somebody was to suck all the air out of the room and say, hey, I'll give you the air back if you'll work for me. And oh, don't worry, I'm going to improve it. That, uh, the air will be a lot better. You really like working for me. You're still unfree if they take the air out. Well, just the fact that they did that with land and other resources a long time ago doesn't make any freer. Thomas Paine endorsed it. John Stuart Mill endorsed it. Bertrand Russell endorsed it. Virginia Woolf did a series of lectures called A Room of Her Own, which were basically calling for a basic income. Uh, G.D.H. Cole, the philosopher in the 1930s, coined the term when uh, a lot of people were starting to look at it. Then uh, in the 40s, it started taking off with economists when you got people like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman interested in it. And in the 1960s and 70s, it had a substantial wave of support where you had economists for it, you had uh, left and right economists for it, you had Democrats for it, you had Republicans for it, you had welfare activists for it, welfare activists uh, up as far as Martin Luther King, who endorsed it uh, just shortly before he was assassinated. And in 1972, both McGovern and Nixon endorsed versions of some kind of income guarantee in their uh in their platforms that year. Uh, after that, it's fallen out a bit, and now it's come back, and now it's the, the movement for it is bigger than ever. The movement is much more grassroots than it's ever been, and it's much more worldwide than it's ever been. Yeah, if Richard Nixon had only not been a psychopath, he might have been a good <laughs> FDR New Dealer. But uh, let, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, as long as, as Nixon was a, a, was, he was a good guy if you could stop it from the criminal treasonous stuff, <laughs> and if you had a highly liberal Congress that he wanted to make deals with. If 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 you could just do those two things, Nixon could do good things. And he created the EPA. Yeah. He was at least for some expansion of the White House, but he did some really bad stuff up too, including yeah. creating a for-profit health care system, the war on drugs to yeah. get at his political opponents. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a uh, one person wrote an article about uh, the negative income tax as being Nixon's good deed. Yeah. But uh, there was another person that I met who's uh, who's now deceased, but who had worked, who had worked in Congress at the time. And he had inside from information that's never really been published saying that Nixon did not want that proposal to pass. He wanted it to fail, and he wanted it to be the Democrats' fault that it failed. And that's pretty much what happened. Uh, let us move on. Uh, we've given a little bit of the back history. I, I Before we did the interview, I was just on uh, Twitter, uh, and I was on a thread with Andrew Yang, who's running for president. Uh, he's a supporter of basic income, and a fellow named Scott Santons, who's an advocate of basic income. And they were arguing over the benefits... What? Yeah. They were arguing over the benefits of uh, UBI versus uh, uh, what's called a, a living wage of fifteen dollars an hour, a minimum wage. Uh, where do you come in on that? Do you think that one is better than the other, or that both can uh, can be uh, feasible? Well, basic income can 
basic income can do some very important things that a minimum wage can't. And a minimum wage has side effects that basic income doesn't have. The side effect of minimum wage is you can say it's illegal to hire somebody for less than this, but you can't ensure that everybody's going to be able to find a job at that wage. Maybe they will, maybe they don't. In, in Denmark, they have a wage much higher than $15 an hour, and they don't have more unemployment than we do. So in some, at least in some circumstances, you can have a much higher minimum wage without higher unemployment. But, uh, but it still doesn't do anything for the people who can't find a job. There's always some, including in Denmark, uh, people who can't find a job or people who simply can't work or people who find the working conditions to be unacceptable. It's a basic human right that if the working conditions are acceptable, somebody wants you to labor for them, not labor for yourself, but labor for an employer, you as a basic human right should have the power to say no to that. And if you take away that power, you're making people unfree. And that's what uh, an economy that doesn't have some kind of universal access to resources or universal uh, financial support in, in lieu of access to resources is, uh, is a country that really doesn't make people free. So basic income is an essential policy that doesn't have these side effects. It also has really great side effects. We have this horrible work incentive problem. We have this, we have this incentive problem in the world today, this really horrible incentive problem where employers don't have incentive to pay good wages. We need to give employers a better incentive to pay good wages. And we have to make laws saying that they got to pay good wages because they don't have the incentive, because, because our, uh, our uh, people are so desperate to get jobs that they don't, that uh, they'll, they'll take some poverty jobs. That's how desperate our workers are. Wage, wages and working conditions that really should be rejected aren't being rejected. So what we need is basic income to help with that incentive problem. So if you don't offer good wages and you don't offer good working conditions, people won't work for you. Then you've got to say, you've got to find out what you can do to get people to want to work for you. That basic income solves that problem better than a minimum wage does. Now, and and it covers everyone. It covers the people who can't work. It covers the people, it covers the people who are too old to work, too young to work, too sick to work, or who have an undiagnosed disorder that keeps them from working. Where if you have a minimum wage and somebody's disorder is undiagnosed, they're in trouble. It takes away this horrible judgment we give to people at, who are unable to work. Uh, uh, it, it does all, it, it uh, because the way things are set up with this very judgmental we system have trying to celebrate the so separate the so called truly needy from the non truly needy is that these so and the thing that the truly needy have to do is work for people who have more money for them to prove that they're good people. Um, I, I don't think the social justice problem in this world is that uh, underprivileged people. Um, underprivileged people aren't fulfilling their duties to work for more privileged people. Um, often people who don't have to work themselves uh, because they have the financial wealth that they don't have to. The, uh, so basic income addresses all of those things. Now a minimum wage, you could have it with a basic income. You can say, we're gonna have a basic income and a minimum wage, that's, that's fine. And if you, uh, that's fine, it might have side effects. I don't think the side effects are gonna be so terrible. But uh, it might have side effects, and it's hard to tell, especially in a country, uh, a minimum wage is especially good in a country like the United States, which has a lot of people who want to immigrate here. Uh, we say, oh, we don't want, we don't want uh, immigration because it supposedly it causes unemployment. Well, uh, just say you have to hire citizens wor work, uh, you have to hire citizens first, and say immigrants can come here, but if they can't find a job, they have to go back. They can come here to search for a job at the minimum wage, so they're not driving wages down. If they can't find a job because all the jobs have gone to citizens or permanent residents, then they go back. There's really not an unemployment problem there. Well, the unemployment slack is taken up by immigration. Immigration then can adjust to the number of people who can find a job. So uh, I have really nothing against the minimum wage, but it just is not as good yeah. as basic. Well, I do. There are some, I and mean, it can cause unemployment in some circumstances, uh, 
And uh, that, but that can, and if you're not doing anything for the unemployed, and we're not doing enough for the unemployed, it has that problem. So uh, I have qualified support for the minimum wage, but it's best as an addendum to basic income. But certainly yeah. it is no replacement for basic income. We can't do half yeah. of what basic income does. Let me uh, then uh, move on to how we pay for this. Now, uh, I want to I want to address the idea because universal basic income, as I understand it, and I'm a supporter of it, is basically raising the minimum floor of what people in society can get. You know, you're raising the floor. But I think concomitantly, we need to lower the ceiling. And by that, I mean, instead of, I've worked for many corporations and I'm against corporate personhood. And I think the, the 1819 Dartmouth decision that legalized uh, corporations as persons was one of the most terrible decisions in uh, US history. Having said yes. that, I think what we need to do is uh, say to these uh, large corporations, especially, well, you know, if you wanna pay your CEO $50 million uh, and, and give him all of these bonuses, we'll say, Okay, let's look at the median and the average wage that you pay your workers, non-management, and we'll allow you up to 10 times the medium or six times the average, whichever is higher, to pay your CEO and maybe seven times for the VPs and, 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 and accordingly. And this way, you want to give 50 million to your CEO? Bravo. But if, if only 10 times the, the, the average wage is half a million, that other 49.5 million, you're still going to have to pay taxes on that to the goddamn government. You're not going to be able to write off, say, a $2 million profit by giving away a uh, million dollar bonuses to your corporate board to say, oh, now we're 10 million in the hole because this happens all the time. You probably know better than I do that there, that research has shown that there's anywhere between 20 and $120 trillion in unpaid taxes to governments worldwide. <laughs> What do you think about lowering the ceiling as well as raising the floor in this argument? Well, that's, that is, that is um, a, a, the idea of creating less inequality is really important. And it's important for efficiency is that, is that we have a really inefficient economy because people have so many resources that they're using them incredibly inefficiently. Mm -hmm. People are flying around on private jets that are that are creating pollution and global warming that doesn't need to happen people are have so much wealth they are buying up they are buying up land in the cities because they got nothing else to do with it now uh, people think oh they're investors well actually a lot of what they're doing is being rentiers they're just buying stuff and then getting the returns on it the real money is not being a ceo yeah. the real money is being a rentier being somebody who owns the stuff and doesn't necessarily do anything. A lot of people who own billions of dollars also do something, but you don't have to. Um, so the uh, you got to get at the rentiers, not just the CEOs. Those are the stockholders, um, and those are the wealthiest people. The the children of the on entrepreneurs. We have a saying in economics that uh, the the entrepreneur eventually becomes a rentier. Eventually, your income from owning stuff. Uh, swamps whatever you got in order to get this stuff. Those CEOs you're talking about, keeping uh, keeping them from these huge salaries will keep them from becoming rentiers, but it won't do a lot for the enormous rentier class we have. Who is and when they're building up, when they when they bid up the price of land in these cities, they cause cities where people can't afford to live in them. Mm. And when you get that, you have extra transportation costs, you have greater poverty. You have wasteful space in the cities that is dedicated only to serving the whims of the ultra rich. And that's where most of our resource use is going to serve the whims of people who have so much access to resources. Meanwhile, other people are living on the street and eating other people's garbage to survive. So it's really inefficient to do it. So yes, I support the idea of trying to make the world more equal. Uh, the actual method you use is, I don't know if that's the best method. It's mm -hmm. not something I've done a lot of research on. I would say it would be better to tie it to the lowest paid employee than the median or the average employee. Okay. And find out what a good ratio is for that yeah. if you're doing something like that. However, you can do it by taxing income, by taxing wealth, or by taxing land and other resource ownership and other kinds of resources you can yeah. um you can do it by you can do it by say instead of giving away the broadcast spectrum basically for free which is what we do now actually the government charging rent for the broadcast spectrum that could raise a half a trillion dollars a year 
Uh, that's half of our budget deficit, just doing that. Um, things like, and the banking system is, mo most of the wealth there is being created by the Fed, but most of the wealth there is going to bankers who are just basically, they get, they get low interest loans from the Fed, they mark them up, and, and lend the money to you and me. That's what most bankers do. And every time something goes wrong, the Fed bails out the bankers yeah. and not the individuals. Stop doing that and start, we're gonna have, have start having a for-profit Federal Reserve, not for the profit of the bankers as it is now, but for the profit of the people and return that money to people of basic income. That could finance a pretty big basic income just by that and take away a lot of that private that private wealth at the top. Another thing you can do to limit inequality on the high end is just get rid of government giveaways to the rich. Mm -hmm. That is an enormous part of our budget. Lobbyists give out these uh, give out these things they like to call campaign contributions, mm -hmm. which are in fact bribes. Yeah. And you give out a couple of these and you buy favorable le legislation, including nonsense stuff. Like we we continue to make pennies because, because the people who sell pennies to the government push a, a lot of bribes called campaign don don um, donations around Washington. And those bribes get us so we don't get rid of the pennies, even though it buys uh, it probably it probably buys a, a one hundredth of what it bought when we got rid of the half penny. So it's it's way. I mean, Carl, oh. we got rid of the half penny. We yeah. don't need the half penny. We don't need the penny. We don't need that nickel. We don't need the dime anymore. You don't need a unit of currency smaller than the smallest thing you can buy. So it's getting to the point where you don't really need the quarter anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, Carl, we make coins out of the dollar and the five dollar, and that's uh, and that's happening just because penny manufacturers are paying a lot of contra campaign contributions. Yeah. And there's so many things like that. The reason your taxes are so complicated is because tax accountants spend a lot of campaign contributions. One thing after another is a government given away. Half of what the Defense Department is spending on is not stuff that the military leaders think we need. It is stuff that private companies want to sell to the government. Well, Carl, let me uh, just jump in here because you I, I was going to bring this up later in the interview, but since you, you tap, tapped on this, let me give you yeah. a, a little row of dominoes. Because I was just, as I said, on the Santon's Yang thread here, and they were talking about how a minimum wage would kill off uh, uh, a lot of uh, service jobs uh, in McDonald's and whatnot. And I'm saying, let them kill them off. Get rid of beef subsidies. Hamburgers go up to $20 for a Big Mac. You have people then buying. It would be cheaper to buy and, and eat produce and good healthy foods. You wouldn't have, for example, we we'd maybe should go back to seasonal fruits again. When I was a boy, you didn't have cherries all year round, you know, importing things from Chile or from the Indonesia. And all of these big, I, I read once uh, where, uh, a few months ago, where a lot of these big container ships that have these huge containers that come on and they go across the Pacific, that one container ship coming from China to the U.S. Uh, uses or puts out more carbon in that one trip than 100,000 cars or automobiles do in one year combined. So I would wow. think I would think that if, if we do these smart things, like getting rid of a lot of these subsidies, there'll be a chain event, I would think, that would be good for the planet, good for the economy. Maybe I'm wrong. What, what are your thoughts on something like that? Oh, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, one of the reasons that there was so little innovation in the Roman Empire was because they had all these slaves that were doing all the work and they didn't need to replace human labor with machines. And it was only towards the Rome, the end of the Roman Empire when slavery was going down as an institution and they needed labor to defend uh, the, uh, them from invasions on all sides that uh, they actually started doing things like creating water wheels and things like that. Um, so yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, higher wages are good for innovation. And what we need is innovation. And uh, cheap labor is cheap labor is a way that, that inhibits in innovation. So I'm not worried about these jobs going away. I want wages to go up a lot. Now, there's, there's two ways to get wages to go up. One is by one is by uh, 
having a, a minimum wage. Well, I, there's, we're talking about two. There's other ways, I'm sure. But uh, one is a minimum wage. One is to give workers the power to say no to bad wages. Yeah. That's what basic income does. That, I think, is the best way. But I think minimum wage can be a good way as well. It's certainly working in Denmark and in Sweden and in Norway and a lot of countries. It is working. It's not creating all, all of this unemployment. It is getting rid of unproductive labor, but so far they've been pre replacing that with productive labor. And I would expect that here. Yeah, I'd like to see all those jobs at McDonald's and all these other places go. Any unproductive job. If you're an employer and you can't make it then and you can't make a living, you can't make your job, you can't, you know, your company won't make a profit unless you pay poverty wages, then you shouldn't be working in this. You shouldn't be operating in this country or really any country. And and uh, uh, and uh, we want employers who have a business model that doesn't rely on causing people to live in poverty and misery. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely for it. And, and that's what... Uh, that's what uh, Franklin Roosevelt said when he was introducing it: is that you've got no business doing this country, doing business in this country if you can't pay living wage. Okay, uh, Carl. Let me uh, uh, get. Uh, uh, we we've hopped around a bit, so I want to sort of try to get uh, a thread going here. Let me start off with the idea of uh, the very necessity in coming decades of uh, UBI because the thing that people don't seem to get is if we're going to have all of this automation and we're going to have robots and artificial intelligence by the middle of this century or earlier perhaps and all these jobs go away who the hell is going to buy all these products if there's no UBI you know well yeah um that that that's a, that's an interesting take on the automation argument because the usual take that people are saying is that, well, there just aren't going to be jobs, there's going to be massive unemployment, and then we're going to have to have UBI. And now, that's all well and good, but that says, the obvious response to that is, uh, is well, if, when and if that, that uh, thing you're saying ever happens, then we'll have UBI. So it makes it sound like UBI is something that, we're going to need someday in the future. We don't have it. We need UBI now, and it's way overdue. Automation is one of the reasons. If you look at what automation is doing right now and what the institutional setting we have for automation, automation should be good for everybody. You produce more at lower, at lower wage costs. So we work less hard. We produce more. That should be good for the whole country. But the way we set it up is that it's good for employers and bad for employees. And the in entire country is dependent on becoming an employee for their job because they don't, they don't have any other option. We don't give people access to resources so they can work for themselves. We've taken the resources and given them to the most privileged people in the, in the country. And what this has done is that as, as we've given workers fewer and fewer op other options and done things like lower the minimum wage, we have created an economy where, where since the 1970s, the, the normal people have not shared in the benefits of economic growth. Real salaries and real wages for most people have not gone up uh, more than like one or two percent in the uh, since the 1970s, we're stagnating as a people, and it's masked by the people are looking at average GDP growth and average per capita income. Well, the average goes up because the 1% or sometimes uh, 2%, sometimes only the half or the tenth of a percent are getting all of these gains. Yeah. So automation is happening, and by working, we are all contributing to it. But the gains are going to this tiny group of people. That is one reason that we need basic income, and it's overdue. We really should have had it 200 years ago when we had the Luddite movement, who were not against yeah. technology, they were against losing their jobs because they had no other income. Now, now, often when you lose your job, you've got to go down to the lowest ring in the ladder. You've built up skills all your life and then your skills aren't needed anymore and you've got to go to the unskilled labor market and in America, that means poverty wages. So, uh, so that's, that's one problem. And the other problem is that automation is disrupting. Well, I guess I've already kind of get it. Automation 
it's good on the whole, but it's really bad for you if you're one of those people whose job is outmoded and you're dependent on labor and you to, to live and your skills aren't needed, so you've got to go and compete with the lowest skilled job market in the country. You've got to take a huge hit. You're, you're likely to be unemployed for a while. You're likely to try things like retraining, which most of the time doesn't work. I mean, retraining is great if it works, but very often you try retraining for something, you can't get a job in that, especially if you're over 50 when this happens. People don't want to hire people in highly skilled jobs that only have 10 years of career ahead of them. So people who lose their jobs very often do not recover in their lives. Maybe their children do, uh, maybe their grandchildren do, but they don't. And the history on this goes way back a long way. If you go back to the enclosure movement where they were kicking peasants off the land in Britain in the 1700s, and, and a lot of those people were, wor they went to the cities and they got jobs and they were worse off for a generation or two before these benefits of automation, which really that was automation too, those benefits of automation finally filtered down to them. And that was also largely due to the labor movement, not the, well, Carl, not the way capitalism works. Carl, let me ask you about some of the arguments that people have used against UBI. And I think most of them are disingenuous. Um, and I, let me give you a parallel. One of the things that I've heard for, forever, basically, is that supposedly uh, democratic social uh, countries in Europe, uh, well, the workers are not as productive as Americans. And people will cite statistics that say, well, an American produces two or three percent more in any particular field over the course of a year. But what they don't factor in is the number of hours worked in that year. And when you factor in that your average American is working something like 2,150 to 2,200 hours, and the average European is working 16 to 1,700 hours, the Europeans are actually much more productive on a per hour basis. They're healthier. They have more time off to, to do things and, and whatnot. So uh, is a part of the reason against UBI a lot of disingenuous disinformation that's put out? Oh, well, I don't know how disingenuous it is. It's wrong. It's wrong. But whether it's completely disingenuous, I don't know. But that is the third thing. Uh, I, I was saying two things about automation. One is... One is that we haven't shared the benefits of it because of this incentive problem where, where employers don't have to share benefits with it. Two is that it is disruptive and it, it, it throws people into poverty, even, uh, even if it's beneficial on the whole. It throws some into poverty, makes them worse off. Now, the third one is what you're saying is that when, when we have automation, we have the opportunity that we can all, on average, work less and get more goods. That's what happens every time you have any sort of technological improvement. That's great, but that hasn't been happening in the United States. It's been happening in other countries like Europe, as you say, it hasn't been happening in the United States. And one of the reasons that we need basic income is to give people the leverage to demand that. Say, well, you know, I got this basic income. I don't wanna work these crazy hours. And I need the leverage to say that. I'd like to have a, a job that was only 30 hours a week. You get some more leverage to say that. You also get more leverage to form a union because it's like an it's it's like a never-ending strike fund that you can go on you can go on strike without starving. So you give people that leverage to command better working conditions and shorter working hours, which ought to be all of our rewards for being part of this economy that produces all this great labor-saving automation. Well, Carl, you mentioned uh, unions. Uh, what before? I want to get on to uh, back to how to pay for it again, as more specifically. But before we do that, let me just ask you. I would assume that you're against uh, things like uh, the Taft Hartley Act from the the forties that uh, uh, gave us right to work states here, which is a total yes, misnomer. And and also things like the Glass Steagall uh, Act that was repealed, which uh, allowed banks to get into insurance and other things that they're not really specialized. Uh, it, where does that fall into this whole argument? Because I think people think of UBI as a, a one-shot thing, but it's really just a component in a larger social vision, is it not? Oh, yes. Uh, there, UBI, it doesn't slice, it doesn't <laughs> dice, it's, it's, it's an, it, it does one thing very well, that people, that ensures that people who have normal needs can have enough financial power to 
to buy those, uh, to, to take care of those needs. It does not provide for those people who have special needs. It's, it's really cruel to say, okay, uh, those of you who are uh, paraplegics, now we have a basic income, uh, spend part of that on your, uh, instead of taking that out of Social Security, you're going to have to, uh, you know, Social Security will buy things like that for people. Yeah. Um, say, oh, uh, you're going to have to buy your, your wheelchair out of basic income. That's a really cruel way to treat paraplegics. And we have things like that for lots of special needs. Um, so, you know, that instead of basic income, you need transportation. Our public transportation system has been horribly gutted in the system. Once again, that's the power of these bribes we call campaign contributions. Yeah. Our, 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 uh, our, uh, we replaced public transit with free public highways uh, because that's what the tire companies, the oil companies, and the car companies paid bribes to get. Um, and also the airline companies, one form of sort of public transit, but a more wasteful one, they lobbied to get special things for them. They got all kinds of special treatment. So these things, the government needs to provide good public transit instead of spending so much money on roads, spend it on public transit. And we need we need legislation that helps people unionize. And we need uh, we need uh, we need a much better health care system. Than, than we need. We flirted with a semi-for-profit uh, healthcare system since Richard Nixon, one of his many bad deeds. And uh, we need to get rid of that and have uh, government provided taxpayer finance free at the po a point of use healthcare like any other civilized nation is going to have. There's a lot of other things for the government to do other than just supporting basic income. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, some of these things, uh, the post-war boom of uh, the whole suburbia thing. This was sort of the Robert Moses generation vision of America oh. and whatnot. And uh, people who don't know, is there was a working uh, black middle class and Robert Moses and his vision and a lot of these big cities from St. Louis to New York just cut black neighborhoods in half and just basically stole a lot of the, the wealth yeah. from these minority communities. Uh, and they've been devastated since. And people don't even understand. They know about slavery. They know about the Civil Rights Act. They don't even know about blockbusting and things like that. But that's a, a topic for another show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the the, uh, the role of the highways, there's good, there's good books on it. Uh, what was it? Uh, a book called Robert Moses and the Decline and Fall of the American City. I can't yeah. remember the exact title. Uh, I've read. Uh, it, yeah. I've I've read little excerpts from it. I, I have dyslexia, so unless I can find that book on audio, I won't read the whole thing. But um, uh, what I've uh, read about it really documents how well it was intentional racism oh, and yeah. in what he did in building those things. Uh, all the things you mentioned, plus trying to make it easy for whites to avoid black neighborhoods by driving over them and get uh, and make it so blacks would be in places where it wouldn't wasn't easy to have a car and so forth. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's many things we've done like that that have just exacerbated inequality in the country. So how, what, what are the two or three major pillars of how to pay for UBI? Uh, I, I spoke a little bit of my own idea of taxing, but since, uh, I mean, what, are there two or three major foundations for UBI to, to, to get this infrastructure in place uh, monetarily? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a I have an article about this. You can find a, a you can find a little simple summary of it on my blog. It's easy to read, or you can read my academic article on the cost of basic income. I estimated that uh, a basic income using two, 2015 data of what was the poverty line then, which was about a thousand dollars for an adult, and maybe you could have half of that for a child. Um, and on that, in 2015 dollars, you could do that for 535 billion dollars a year. It's just not that expensive. I mean, we've got a, you know, our budget deficit thanks to the Bush and Trump tax cuts, not to mention the Reagan and or Elder Bush tax cuts. Um, uh, you reverse some of those, that pays for all of that right there. But those, the taxes they cut weren't the best possible taxes. There's a lot of other ways to get revenue to pay for that. Um, and that uh, a wealth tax is a very good tax. A progressive income tax is okay if you don't have other things. But there are a lot of other things. One, as I've been saying, and the government giveaways, which means getting money out of politics, and all these government giveaways, and that frees up billions of dollars a year because a huge part of our, when I say government giveaways, I need to corporations who lobby. Uh, 
end these things and use that to help real people. Uh, the government giveaways to the banks, to the oil companies, to the car companies, to the defense contractors, one thing after another. Um, end those things and then start to tax resources and rents and the things that the government is giving away free. If we tax, if we, if we, if we make people pay rent for using the broadcast spectrum, that could pay for most of a basic income, yeah. uh, and, and or a use and actually a a, a a a a Federal Reserve Board that's not for the banks but makes money for the people that could pay for it. Um, uh, a land value tax in our cities that takes away the incentive for people to bid up and bid up and bid up the price of real estate in the cities and make them unlivable for, for so many people. That could pay for basic income. And one of the things to know about this is that the reason it's so much cheaper than people think is they look only at the payment. They'll just take the population, multiply that by the basic income and think that's the cost of basic income. You gotta remember that everybody is paying for the basic income yeah. and everybody is receiving the basic income. And the cost, and the basic income is essentially a negative tax. That's why one version of this called the negative income tax. The basic income is a negative tax and your other taxes are positive taxes. So when a positive tax meets a negative tax, they cancel each other out. Most of what basic income is for every about five or six dollars that you're actually transferring from the haves to the have nots. For every dollar that you're doing that, maybe five or six dollars are just the haves paying themselves or the have nots paying part of their own basic income. Yeah. So the actual net cost, which is the real, the net redistributive effect of it, how much are you taking from those who have, how much less do they have, and how much more do the have nots have, that is the cost of basic income, and that is much less. A poverty level one would cost, uh, I estimated, 535 billion. One that's a little bit better, I mean, the poverty line in this country isn't good, a better one, is gets a lot more expensive. The twenty thousand dollar one, uh, with uh, I think it was ten thousand dollars per child. I estimated that cost was um, I don't remember exactly. I think it was between one point five and two billion dollars a year. Uh, sorry, yeah, there's a big sub trillion dollars a year. That is that is I think a much better one. But when you look at one that size, there's a lot of elements of the way welfare state you can replace, mm -hmm. such as um, the parts of Social Security, not others, and things like food stamps, which would be superfluous if we have a $20,000 a year basic income. Well, I wanted to talk about uh, experiments outside the U.S. regarding UBI in a moment, but is, do you think one of the reasons UBI here in the U.S. Uh, you know, has such a negative connotation is this ridiculous, what I call ridiculous adulation of this Adam Smith idea of the free market, because I've always said there's never been a goddamn free market. There are always players in a market who are looking to subvert the market for their own ends. And UBI is an antidote to that. It's it's a way to try to, it's not going to totally work 100%, but it's going to level the field a bit more. Is UBI actually more in the spirit of free market, do you think? Well, UBI is extremely compatible with, with a free market. There is... Uh, there, there is a, a, an extremely free market version of UBI, and I got, I got nothing against Adam Smith. Adam Smith is a much better guy than his followers make him out to. His followers want to make him out to be this evil, cruel man that he wasn't. He, uh, he said that no country can be considered wealthy when people are in poverty and misery, and he said that the poor are always the workers are always at a disadvantage, I, I don't remember the exact quote here, but he said that the workers are always at disadvantage against employers because they have to get a job and employers don't have to hire anybody. Employers can work on their wealth, can live on their wealth for a very long time, and workers, a couple of paychecks, and they're out of work. But Adam Smith recognized these things. He also recognized the need for public works. Now, and, and one of his major themes was actually to get the government from to stop giving away these giveaways to connected wealthy people. Mm -hmm. That was the really the when he was talking about the free market, that was the main thing he was talking about. 
tariff laws that help a few companies and hurt everybody else. Um, royal charters to be the monopolist of this that helped one company and hurt everybody else. That's what he was against. And if Adam Smith was alive today, he'd be talking about corporate welfare. That all this all this stuff that lobbying gets us. So Adam Smith is a great guy. Now, but uh, he also, he did, of course, argue for a free market, which was very progressive at the time because governments were doing very little to actually help people. They were doing things to help the wealthy. Now, if you have a basic income that is, that is, uh, you, you could have a basic income, but if it's high enough to live on at a decent level, then you can do without a minimum wage. And you can do it without of many things that, many things that, the countries it, uh, that we're doing for for right now, in uh, depending on what real estate prices are like, you you if it's high enough that people can afford a big uh, can afford a livable apartment in a big city, um, then you don't need public housing. Now it's it's not likely to be that high, and we're still going to need public housing or housing subsidies of some kind, or uh, we a big change in our housing policy to make housing affordable in the cities. Um, getting rid of that. Uh, Assuming we don't have that, you need a really big basic income to make it so people can afford to live in the cities. You could even have a basic income where you have a private health care system and we have this just enormous basic income so people can actually afford private health insurance. Yeah, you need a pretty big basic income to do it, but you do that. Or you do some variation of that. Okay, we're going to get rid of some things and not others. Um, you do that and what you have is a capitalist economy where income doesn't start at zero. And that is so much better than a capitalist economy based on making all normal people fear poverty and do whatever it takes to fear homelessness and destitution, including taking jobs that leave them still in poverty. So um, that model of basic income, the free market model of basic income, is such an improvement on what we have. But to get a real free market, you're going to have to get, a, get rid of a lot of government giveaways for, for the wealthy. Well, let me, uh, I, I want to do one more segment after this, but, but I want to end this segment just asking, because it seems implicit in what you just said. Uh, do you do you believe that there really are actors in the, the economic scene, so to speak, that really don't have malign intent? I, th I think that there are people that do want a slave class. They do want to have people who are in a permanent subservience to them and permanent dependence. I think there are people that actively benefit financially and otherwise from this. Uh, do you agree with that or not? Just... Uh, um, I think you should never underestimate people's ability to believe their own bullshit. <laughs> that a lot of people who are saying these things are true believers. They have convinced themselves that what they're saying really is true and i'm sure i'm guilty about i'm guilty about that as some things but uh there was there was a a, a large there was an enormous claim that was made by it was made by slave owners for for hundreds of years during slavery in the united states where they would say that slavery benefits yeah. both free and bond as a matter of fact it was in the texas state declaration of uh, their, their statement of causes for why they uh, declared independence from the United States and joined the Confederacy. They, one of the things they mentioned, slavery is an institution that is African slavery, is an institution that, that was good for both bond and free. And that's a quote, um, or worked for the benefit of both the bond and free. And they, they, I, I'm sure some people knew that was that was bullshit, but I think a lot of other people really believe that bullshit because people will were sincere racists at mm -hmm. the time. They sincerely believe that the white race was civilized and the black race was a savage, and that if you brought the black race in this inferior black race in to contact with white people, it could do nothing but benefit them. They really believe that nonsense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nonsense people believe. Um, and so I, I think you shouldn't see that there's a, a, a conspiracy of lies around here. There is some, 
There is some, but even the reason those people tell lies rather than say, well, we're just going to do all this for our benefit. The reason they tell those lies is because millions of people who feel like they're on their, the side of those people who are lying will believe it. There's no point in telling a lie that nobody believes. And millions of people who are against government action to create inequality and eliminate poverty and make a world where normal people aren't forced to work but work because they freely choose to because they have good wages and good working conditions. Uh, most of the people who are against those policies really believe the reasons that, they're, that they get for them. I want to pick up in this uh, final segment uh, on a couple of threads that have been left dangling. Um, I think, personally, me, Dan Schneider speaking, that the idea of a common wheel has gone out the window. And when I say that, I, I, I think it socially, financially, economically, there's, there's this idea that we're all in this together has been tossed out the window. And I think UBI is a thing that will bring that back. I personally, I was born in 1965, think that this started with Reagan and his so-called revolution, which I think was just uh, selfishness upon selfishness upon selfishness. And we could get into talking about AIDS and we can talk about the uh, cut, cuts in, in social programs and basically all, all that stuff. Um, I think we need to, to sort of get rid of the Reagan revolution. I think UBI is one of those things that near four decades going on, it's time to get rid of that. Do you, where do you pinpoint, if anywhere, uh, in the American timeline where we, we've we gotten to where we are. Do you think that the that Reagan is sort of uh, ground zero for the current mess we're in? Well, you, you know, it's something that's happened very gradually. And the uh, it's something that's happened very gradually. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to pinpoint. There's no one starting point. But... Uh, there's so many things you can point to. There's even one that I was reading about recently. One of the one of the arguments that people gave for slavery uh, oh, it was a horrible, horrible argument, but it might have been based partly in fact. The argument was that because we have this extra low class here, the the blacks, yeah. uh, white people treat each other better <laughs> uh, because we all know. What nobody, the people we're talking to, is not the lowest person, and that white people, or that uh, that there's so much, there's so much hierarchy, and the, there's so much desire for hierarchy that people just want some, somebody to be below them. It's a horrible thing. So we're going to exploit these human beings, so these other human beings will be nicer to each other. And there could be some element of that because a lot of one of the a lot of New Deal policies were written in sort of racist ways that make it harder for blacks to get them and shutting out a lot of black, black, uh, uh, migrant laborers weren't covered who were non-white. Um, uh, women were expected to be non-workers and it would only be, you know, they basically they had to get married to a man and people like sharecroppers didn't really have anything for them. They were written in these sub very subtly racist ways to get the Southern Democrats on board with them. Now, then we have the civil rights movement. And we're saying, no, it, it, this is, it, we can't have a racist welfare system. We gotta have a welfare system that's good for everybody. Now, we haven't succeeded in that, but we've moved toward that and tried to create it through civil rights. And that has turned, that has turned a lot of these Southern Democrats who were for redistribution to other white people, now they're against redistribution to anybody, and they joined. And, they, and Nixon started courting them in in 1969, right after right after Wallace helped him win by getting a lot of the white Southern vote. And gradually, we've gone from this weird coalition of parties. Uh, the two parties were both weird coalitions from uh, for all of the 20th century. It's come to a conservative party and a liberal party, and the conservative party is gradually from Nixon to Reagan to uh, Bush, who had been a moderate, signing on with all of this and all the racist stuff he did, uh, with uh, and the younger Bush as well, and Trump being the really culmination of it is that Trump was, is the first one who will actually uh, who will actually bring some of this subtle underlying racism and make it loud and overt racism and still say, I'm not a racist. Um, and so this 
but this racism is also it's also more classism is that we're not just demonizing blacks we're still demonizing them the most but we're demonizing everybody who is everybody who doesn't make a lot of money is you're a bad person you're not working hard enough. you're not smart enough you're doing or you're a welfare chiseler you can you can, uh, you know, uh, apply for disability because your arms are cut off, and so people will give you all these tests to prove to prove that you're truly needy and not some welfare chiseler. Ask people who've gone through the welfare system. And yet, Jeff Bezos um, wants and, wants handouts for Amazon. Well, Jeff Bezos recently, the Amazon got rebuked by New York City uh, for wanting to build a plant there. And yet, Jeff Bezos, who's now almost twice as wealthy as Bill Gates, still wants tax breaks. I mean, give me a goddamn yeah, break. For, Ridiculous. Yes, yeah, horrible. So we've had this. So one of the transitions of this, you're, you're, you're on your own, is that before it was white people are kind of in this together and everybody else is on their own. Now it's like you're on your own. And if you don't have a, you're, it's it's the government and the corporate lobbyists and uh, the corporations who benefit from them and everybody else is on their own. And that's a horrible mentality. We are all in this together. And if you're not going to stand in solidarity with somebody who is unwilling to work, you got no business calling yourself a progressive. Yeah. If you do that, as a lot of Democrats have been running away in the last few weeks, they've been following this with the Green New Deal. They've been running away yeah. from the idea of what they originally said, which was we need income support for people who are unable or unwilling to work. And if you won't do that, you are signing on with the essence of the conservative of the conservative system that we have. The system that says that the employer is always right, no matter how low the wages are, how poor the working conditions are, you should never be unwilling to work. That we have some really crappy jobs in this yeah. country. Uh, read about the meat packing industry since they gutted the unions there. It, a horrible, dangerous, dirty places to work with low wages and terrible working conditions. I've worked in um, many of them. And, um, and yet, we, and, and if you won't support the people who are unwilling to work because in, in a world where jobs are there, you think you're not progressive. Yeah. You're just a conservative. You are, you are think the, that the people with more money know what's good for people with less. If you will not free the worker so they have the power to say no to bad jobs, you are against the poor. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the whole thing about uh, black uh, racism against blacks. Because I, oh, I, wor I worked not just against the poor. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. If you will not free the worker and give them the power to say no, you're against all normal people. Well, the, the the interesting side thing is when we talk about in America classism, which I racism is a subset of classism. When we talk about a class called white trash, it's often portrayed that the white people say, well, at least you're not black. But by the same token, you get the reverse thing. A, a lot of the, the poor whites have this idea that, well, uh, uh, the black people can't help themselves because they're, they're not as good as us. But if you're in you know, a white trash, you've chosen to be white trash by your actions. And so there's this subtle kind of social psychology that goes on in the, the next lowest class that, you know, you may be above this class, but you've chosen to be there. But again, that's another another distinction. I wanted to bring up the idea. Oh, yeah. And there's, I tell you, there was nothing good about that racist welfare state. There was yeah. never anything good about the attitude that whites are, are all in this together yeah. and blacks and everybody else isn't. That was just a horrible, horrible uh, thing to do. Plantations um, are bad, yeah, whether they're in the U.S. or the Philippines. About One of the things about uh, white nationalism or any kind of nationalism, whether it's Trump or it's Putin or, or it's Erdogan in Turkey, or it's uh, Balasarios in Brazil, or what's his name in the Philippines, is that they, they, all, they, all they offer to the working class people of whoever their in-group is, is the satisfaction of knowing someone is below you. Right. They, do, they never end up offering them anything really good. Is that they think, oh, as soon as we get rid of these immigrants or these, uh, these, these or these bad people, then everything's going to be fine for the rest of us. No, they'll no, they'll find someone else to blame your misery on. And what works for them is a continual war of us against them. And well, us against them thinking is what is wrong with the world. That causes most of our problems. I mean, the idea that the people in such and such group are bad. And you can convince yourself of that really, really easily. But there are no bad demographic groups. There are no bad yeah. 
Uh, there are no bad ethnicities. Well, it's, uh, it's a no version of the scab mentality. If you won't do it, we'll yeah. find someone who'll do it for 10 cents less or whatever. I wanted to talk about Finland, the uh, the Finland experiment in UBI. I think it was in the major, one of the major cities. Can you just briefly talk about that? Sure. The Finland experiment was a really small experiment. Yeah. It was a small number of people getting a small basic income for a short amount of time, two years. It was introduced not by the left of center Finnish government, uh, uh, a left of center Finnish government, but a coalition, a right of center coalition. And uh, they did it. They just wanted to, to look at what would happen if people who are eligible for unemployment insurance uh, had a basic income. And they found out that they worked about the same amount and they were way better off. And they said, oh, that's bad. Oh, they're not working more. Uh, they're better off. Who cares if if low income people are better off, all we care is that they work more. How cruel and horrible they interpreted that. The results were, were very good actually, is that, um, is that people feel more secure and are less afraid and can try more things. That, um, those are the good things. But I've just written a book about basic income experiments. I'm starting, this, starting another thing here, but Basic income experiments can never tell us what we most want to know about it. I've got a whole book on that. It's a long, complex mm -hmm. argument. But they focus our attention on things that are easy to measure. Yeah. And the things that are easiest to measure are very often not the most important questions. And it's also the things that are easy to measure in experiments, which are not things that are easy to measure on, on, if you do it on a national scale. Um, and is, so let me let me just ask: have limited value. Do you think, limited. Do you think that's a, a flaw in human nature? I mean, uh, when we talk about corporations, they never look beyond uh, a quarter or two ahead of time. That we want to shine, we want the instant gratification, and technology, especially in the last twenty or thirty years, has given us that that long term plan. I mean, global warming. I mean, we, we've known now for 20, 25, 30 years uh, about global warming. And now now people, you know, we're still fumbling away time. Yeah, I just recently read that most of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere right now uh, have been put there in the last 25 years. Yeah. So if we'd just done something about it 25 years ago, we wouldn't be in this mess. Uh, no. What was arrested? Was there more to your question? Well, I just wanted to uh, get, I, I want to get, uh, so have you give uh, your any uh, closing arguments, but let me just go back to t tax rates. Um, one of the things that you said that there's not particularly one area you can pinpoint as sort of the turning point to where we are now, but I find it always odd that uh, uh, under Eisenhower, a Republican president, uh, although certainly not a modern Republican as we we think of them. He may have been the last of the reasonable Republicans. Uh, we had a 90% marginal tax rate for the wealthiest. Them. And this isn't 90%, this 90% over whatever, you know, a certain level, 10 million or whatever it might have been at the time. Uh, and yet it was JFK, a Democrat, I believe, in 61 or 62, who began the, the rollback uh, uh, of the 90% the top rate. Uh, do you do you think that we need to go back, uh, as has been bruited uh, the last few weeks by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and a few other people newly elected to Congress, to uh, at least a 70 percent or higher uh, top marginal tax rate? Well, what we need is policies that are going to address income inequality at the highest levels, for reasons that I've said before. The, Income tax is not necessarily the best one to do that. Uh -huh. If uh, we need wealth tax, a, a, a rent and resource tax, the elimination of all corporate giveaways, which means we need the elimination of these bribes we call campaign contributions. You do those things and you can raise a lot of revenue from a wealth tax and from rent and resource taxes and for fees for uh, things like using the broadcast spectrum. You do that and you've addressed inequality a lot. Now, whether we also need to raise income tax rates, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if, if you're not doing these things and the only option is raising income tax rates, then you have to do it. But there's side effects of income tax rates, especially one that high, is then you have to have a really complex system. Well, we have a complex system anyway. 
a complex income tax system because you can't charge somebody 90% and then not have a lot of deductions in case somebody really does have a lot of expenses. Hmm. So there's some incomes that look like they're really big, but actually if you look at this person's expenses, they're not that big. So then you've got to have a complex system that looks into all these problems. Hmm. A basic income with, say, a 50% marginal tax rate and which is pretty high, it's you know higher than we have now, and with no deductions, um, would be, I think, far superior than something without a basic income and a 90, you know, fits along with these other things to get well, the top wealth and things like that. Uh, it would be far superior to a non-basic income system with a hugely complex rate and a 90% top, top, top rate. But I'll take us, you know, if that's the policy on the table, uh, you know, at this point, we're so unequal. Basically, any policy that's going to take from the people who have a hugely excessive amounts and give to the people who are who, who are normal people who are either in poverty and destitution or homelessness or are working because of fear of that, not getting the wages they they should be getting because of fear of that, then basically any policy that's going to do some of that, I'm going to support. So I would support a 70 a 90% top tax rate, even though I think in, in the best circumstances, it might not be necessary. Well, I want to end the interview by asking one final question and then give you a, a few minutes to give any mm-hmm. closing remarks that you want. Um, my my uh, question would be, um, it sounds to me that throughout this, uh, that UBI is a, a foundational thing uh, for a society. What would be <laughs> step two, step three after UBI, in your opinion, and then, you know, let me, you know, you can uh, finish with uh, any closing remarks you want on any upcoming works you have or anything. Well, step two, step three after UBI um, is a good question. I think what we, we have to have to uh, do to get UBI, the most important thing we, to do at UBI is to really change our mindset, to understand that. We want to build a community out of truly free people. And if we want to build a, a community out of truly free people, we cannot just take all the resources, give them to a few, have them pay nothing back to everybody else who therefore cannot work for themselves. Uh, is that we have, and therefore we must stand in solidarity with the people who are unwilling to work. And that's going to benefit that's going to benefit everybody who has to work for a living, all normal people. It's not basic income is not about the poor only. It is about everyone who's in that position where I have no choice to, but to work to keep myself alive. Now, that mindset and that's a very it's it is a very together mindset, the mindset that I cannot force my neighbor to provide to, to work for me. I need to create a system where everybody is getting positive incentives to do these things. I will stand in solidarity for those with those who have less for me, even if they will not reciprocate. That mentality is what we need. You do that and people, you do that and you have solid support for basic income. What we need next, uh, well, uh, it's not so much next, you know, there's so many other things we do. Well, we need better public transit. We need, uh, we need to get rid of these corporate giveaways. We need a wealth tax and, and or, you know, uh, rent and resource taxes. And we need uh, good support for people who have special needs and probably a lot of other things that aren't coming to mind. What one of these things come, come in is, uh, is harder for me to say, but we need, we need a lot of changes in this country. We are oppressive to, people at the low end of the income spectrum, and we will not face that. That What we have is oppression of, of racial and ethnic minorities and low-income people. And finally, what, uh, what uh, is your next upcoming book or, or work or lecture or whatever you're going to be doing next uh, in this regard? Well, any uh, regard. Let's see. Um, I... Uh, uh, I I just came out with a book called A Critical Analysis of Unconditional Basic Income Experiments. That's out on Palgrave just last month. I uh, am working on a book called The Prehistory of Private Property, looking into some of the arguments about uh, 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 for why we should have unfettered property 
uh, un unfettered property ownership and looking at their empirical claims about property and its history and showing that they're not true, that there's there's supposedly a, a trade-off between equality and freedom, which which is nonsense. That there is supposed that uh, supposedly there's something natural about specifically private property, which is historical nonsense. That uh, and that um, and that, in, that that inequality is is e that um, inequality is incompatible with freedom or impossible to uh, get whatsoever. Um, impossible to create whatsoever or that capitalism is the freest society ever it is certainly not uh, so i uh, and even in freedom measured as freedom as interference by other people uh, that's what i'm arguing for in this next book i'm also after that i'm writing a book called basic income essential knowledge for mit press i have various articles coming out i have one coming out in uh raisons politiques it's in english but the uh, the, the article's in English, but the journal has a French name, which is uh, which is about my theory of justice. Justice is the pursuit of accord, and it explains some of the reasons why we need to stand in solidarity with normal people, even if they're unwilling to work. Uh, so I'm speaking, let's see, speaking engagements. I'm speaking at a poverty conference in Tallahassee, Florida, um, a week from Friday, and I am going to have a small role at the uh, North American Basic Income Guarantee Congress in uh, New York in June, a larger role at the Nordic Basic Income Congress in Oslo in April, and then also a, 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 I'll be giving a plenary talk at the uh, Basic Income Earth Network Congress in Hyderabad, India in uh, August. So if you're gonna be in Hyderabad this August, well, meet me there. <laughs>